Um, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start a little mini-series this morning uh, on radical commitment and what it means to be committed uh, to Jesus Christ. And so in 1851, England hosted the very first World's Fair. And at that time, uh, it became known as the, the, Crystal, uh, the Crystal Palace uh, Exhibition, is what it's called, the Crystal Palace Exhibition. And so I discovered this because one of the uh, uh, huge soccer team in England is called Crystal Palace. And one day I was like, why is it called that? And I looked it up, and it was because of this fair that they used to have there. In the 19th century, these fairs, state fairs and world fairs and all these things were very, very popular. And this was the very, very first one uh, that happened over in England. And what it did was it brought all these nations together and uh, they were able to showcase culture and art and technology and industry and all of these things. And during that particular time, steam power was the rage. Everything, they had discovered this and everything was being done and advanced and all these new machines and things were being built, locomotives and boats and looms and organs and all of these things were being built. And so they would go through the fair and they would judge, right? Winners of all these different categories and stuff, just like we do at our fairs. And the winner of that category that year was this invention that somebody had made with steam, this machine, and it contained over 7,000 different parts, all kinds of gears and pulleys and bells and whistles and trinkets and all of these things moving and going and making noise and all of these things. But you know what was the most interesting thing about that machine is that it didn't actually do anything. It just made a whole lot of motion and a whole lot of noise and movement and spectacle, but it didn't actually do anything. That right there is a perfect illustration for way too much of the modern contemporary Christian. There's a whole lot of outer stuff going on, but nothing is actually being accomplished in here or for the kingdom. See, external does not automatically equate to internal. The reality is that there are many Christians today all over America and all over the world that have been saved for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, whatever that may be, and yet on the inside, they are still just as immature in their faith as they were when they first came to God. People that have been coming to church for years, people that have been raised in church, they don't know any more about the Word of God than they did the day that they were saved. Inside, they are still selfish, unforgiving, bitter, Gossipy, even sinful. Very little growth has taken place. Very little change has happened in the deep parts of their heart. Externally, we change a lot. We know what to say. We know what to do. We know how to look. We know how to worship. We know we, and we may love those things and enjoy those things. And we do all these things. But unfortunately, deep inside where God is truly wanting to get in and change us, we're not allowing Him in. And so it leads us, I believe it leads us to this question that we have to ask ourselves, and that is, why am I a Christian? What, what, why is it that I choose to go to church on Sunday? Why is it that, that I have... Come to Christ. What is my desire? What's the end game here? What am I trying to move towards or learn? What is the outcome that I'm looking for? Because if it's simply a get out of jail free card, if it's simply a get out of hell free card, you're in the wrong place. God is not interested in that. If it's simply because, well, it's the right thing to do or the popular thing to do, 
Maybe it makes us feel good. Or maybe it makes us feel dignified or, or whatever towards other people, you know. Did you realize that no one is forcing you to be a Christian? No one came to your house this morning and made you get up and come here. Unless you're under 18. Then maybe some people did. No one is forcing you to seek God or serve God. If you don't want to be a Christian, you know what the reality is? You don't have to be. God is not looking for lukewarm people. He's looking for people that are on fire, that are seeking Him and desiring Him and want to be in His presence. See, the end game should be to become more like Christ. Is that not our desire? Is that not what the Word of God says? That our desire is that over time, we become more and more like Christ. That little by little, there is less of me and more of Him. God offers a gift of salvation to each and every one of us, and He desires that we take it, but it is not compulsory. It's your option. If you're going to be a Christian, it takes commitment, doesn't it? How many know that it's easier to be a sinner? It's much easier. When somebody told you if you come to Christ, everything in your life's going to be smooth sailing and perfect, they lied to you. They're reading a different Bible. The reality is it takes sacrifice and commitment and work because God says, I don't want part of you. I want all of you. It takes being honest with ourselves. It takes evaluating our lives, evaluating our priorities and say, hey, what is important to me in my life? And being able to step back and be honest with ourselves and say, you know what? Is God actually the number one and most important thing in my life? And if we recognize that he's not, being able to say, oh God, okay God, help me to change that. Because I want you to be first in my life. I want to be a vessel that you can use for the kingdom. Being willing to repent and change who we are. We have to stir up inside of us the fire that God has placed in there. And that's what we need to talk about this morning, is stirring up that fire. Let's look at, at 2 Peter here. 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of God our Savior and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our, our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also apply all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. And having been established in, in the truth, which is present with you, I consider it right. As long as I am in this earthly 
dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as and uh, excuse me, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made uh, clear to us and clear to me, I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure you will be able to call these things to mind. So let's look, first of all, at lighting the fire. I was thinking about this message, and as I began to go through it in this concept, it really made me think about the day that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I was thinking about that day, and you know what the reality is? I don't remember what I did that day. I don't remember what I wore that day. I don't remember what I ate that day. I, don't re I remember nothing about that day. However, those few moments that I gave my life to Christ are ingrained in my mind. I can imagine it right now and picture everything about that particular moment. I remember going up to the altar and a brother coming up and praying with me. And he asked me, you know, do you want to accept Christ as your Savior? And I said, yes, and I got saved. And I remember it's just very vivid and ingrained in my mind. I cannot explain it to you, but in that moment, my life drastically changed. I did not get up from that altar a perfect person. I did not get up from that altar and, and never struggle with sin again. But I was different and I was changed. In that moment, I wanted all of God that I could get. We were invited to church. One time, there was never any commitment or, or agreement that I would ever go back to church and really didn't have any intention or plan to. But from that moment that I got up from that altar, I can literally count on one hand the amount of times I have missed a Sunday service in the last 20 years. I wanted all of God that I could get. If those doors were open, I wanted to be there. If there was a need that needed to be filled, I wanted to fill it. I wanted to serve. I wanted more of Him. I was in His Word. That doesn't mean that for the past 20 years there haven't been ups and downs. But from that moment, God drastically altered the course of my life forever. And in that moment, I didn't realize how much He was going to alter my life. At that time, we were in the military. I had every intention of retiring in the military and staying in it. I loved it. But God said, no, 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 I got a different plan. And I was like, yeah, God, but, but that's a great paycheck, a great job, and a great retirement plan. But God altered the direction of my life forever. So let me ask you a question. Do you remember... When you gave your life to Christ. Do you remember that moment. That you finally made the decision. I'm done playing games. I'm done playing church. It doesn't work. I don't want to be part of this sinful world. Do you remember that moment. When you let go of your sin. You repented. You accepted Christ as your savior. And all of a sudden, you are no longer on that path anymore. You are no longer the same person. But God has put you on a new path. Do you remember that all of a sudden, that burden was lifted off of you? All of a sudden, you didn't feel all that burden of sin and regret and all those decisions that you made that God just lifted them off of you. For the first time, you felt real forgiveness. You felt God's acceptance and His love. And all of a sudden you have this realization that you are on your way to heaven and there's no one in the world that convinced you otherwise. Well, how do you know that you're saved? You know, you know what people say. Well, I know that I know that I know. You remember how people say that or whatever? You know why they say that? Because I cannot describe it to you, but I know that God changed me. I know by faith that I am on my way to heaven. In that very moment, what has transpired is that God lit a fire inside of each and every one of us. 
Think about that. John the Baptist says in Matthew 3.11, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It is in that moment that we become children of God. It is in that moment that we become heirs to all of the promises of God. Verse 4 of our text, For by these He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. It is in that moment that a fire has been lit inside of every single one of us. But here comes the issue. Let's look secondly at maintaining that fire. There is an extremely critical part of this that a lot of people, they maybe they don't understand, they don't grasp, or they don't take serious enough. And that is that it is the responsibility of us to keep that fire burning. It's not God's responsibility. It is our responsibility. God lights that fire, but God does not keep it burning. Let's examine something in the Old Testament for a moment. Somebody once said the Old Testament is an anticipated picture of what God was going to do in the New Testament through Christ. We've said this before. Most of the things that we see in the Old Testament are a picture of, of a reality that takes place in the New Testament. So let's examine this. Look at what Paul says when he's speaking about the Jewish laws. He's speaking about the Jewish festivals in Colossians chapter 2. He says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Again, he's talking about Jewish dietary laws and festivals and all these things that they were required to do. And in verse 17, he says, Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance of it belongs to Christ. Now with that in mind, we look at the fire that took place in the tabernacle. God designed the tabernacle as a place where he would dwell and the people could have relationship with him through that. Because until Christ came, there was a separation between man and God. And the first thing that we see is that in there, there is the altar. There is the fire. And it is God that lit that fire. Not the priests, not man, but God lit that fire. Leviticus 9.23. Excuse me. Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And then the fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell down on their faces. We see this multiple times in the Old Testament. You remember the story of Elijah and how he was going against all the prophets of Baal and he had them bring out their sacrifice and he brought out his sacrifice. And to prove this point that it is God that lights the fire, he poured buckets and buckets and buckets of water everywhere over the sacrifice so that everybody knew there's no trickery here. There's no way that thing is starting a fire on its own. And God sent fire from heaven and consumed that. God lit that fire. But God made it very clear that in the day-to-day -day activities of the tabernacle that it was the responsibility of the priest to maintain that fire and to keep that fire lit at all times, 24-7. That fire was to never go out. When God was explaining to them how to run the tabernacle in Leviticus chapter 6, He says, the fire on the altar shall be, uh, shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out, but the priest shall burn wood on it every morning. And he shall lay out the burnt offerings on it and offer up in smoke the fat portions of the peace offering on it. The fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It shall never, ever, ever go out. Fast forward into the New Testament. We no longer have a separation between us and God. Christ is the one that bridged that gap. Now you and I have direct access to God and to the kingdom. 
We are the priests of our home. It is our responsibility to maintain that fire and to keep that fire lit and that it should never, ever go out. If you look at verse 10 of our text, it says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior will be abundantly supplied to you. All of these promises, all of these things, what does he say? He says, be diligent. Make certain. Be on top of this. Don't let these things lax because it is our responsibility. He goes on to say, stir these things up in you. And as a minister, he says to the people, I'm going to constantly remind you to stir them up. And that's very critical. Because as a minister, our job is to preach these things in the word of God and let people know and remind and poke and prod and bring God's word. But we cannot stir the fire in your spirit up for you. All we can do is remind. You must be the one to stir it up. Let's look lastly at fanning the flame. How many people do you know that have walked away from God because they allowed the fire in their spirit to go out? Now there are times throughout our salvation where that fire, man, it's just, it's a bonfire. And there are times when it looks like a match. We have ups and downs. We have good times and bad times. We have trials. We have tribulations. We're on the mountain sometimes. We're in the valley sometimes. That's the reality of life. And that's certainly the reality of being Christian. But there comes a certain point when you watch people allow that fire to go out and they walk away from God. We've seen it multiple times. It usually begins with their words. You start noticing them saying certain things. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, that's weird. This person was like an on-fire Christian and like basically they're kind of like distancing themselves a little bit from church or church people. They start being like a little judgy towards other people in church or the minister or the worship. And you just, you notice them doing these things. You notice them start missing church more often, start being late. And then all of a sudden you start to get concerned. They're drifting. They're allowing that fire to die down. They're allowing all of these things and they're slowly moving away from God. How many of you have witnessed exactly what I'm talking about? And you get scared and you get concerned for them because no matter how, what we do, we cannot stir that fire up inside of you. It's your responsibility. You notice that all of a sudden their worldly friends start becoming more and more prominent as a part of their life rather than their church or their church friends. And you notice them starting to drift little by little. And it's a scary thing because I can tell you that, that being in church for 20 years, I can tell you this undeniable fact. Every time you see a person backslide, come back to Christ, backslide, come back to Christ. Every time it gets harder and harder and harder for them to come back. And they will tell you, it becomes harder and harder. They become numb and, and immune. See, when we first get saved, everything is perfect. You call it the honeymoon period, right? When you first get saved and you first give your life to Christ, man, it's like nothing can go wrong. That fire is burning. You are so excited for the things of God. Everything's awesome. Everything's wonderful. Everything is perfect in your life. It's powerful. God is moving. And then eventually, you know, the fire kind of goes down to like a, a normal level. It kind of goes down to that maintenance of just day-to-day -day things. And here becomes the issue. If we do nothing, what will happen to that fire? it will go out. If we do nothing, it will go down and down 
and down. Fires are always so big and powerful when they're first lift, lit, but if you leave them alone, they will go out. You must put fuel on that fire. You must keep air flowing through that fire. You have to grasp this responsibility that it's our responsibility. No one can do it for you. There's a reason that God wants a fire burning inside of us. The reason that God wants that fire burning in us is because He understands and knows that we are going to go through difficult times in life. The Bible symbolically uses this idea of the storms and the winds and the rains coming against our life because that's a reality. And all those things that come against us are trying to put the fire out in your heart. Verse 13 of our text, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is eminent as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will also be diligent. Any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to your mind. What does he say? He doesn't say at any time, people are going to remind you and help you to keep that going. He says, no, no, no. You need to recall to your mind the things of God. You need to recall to your spirit the words that God has spoken to you, what He's done in your life. We need to be reminded and go back to that point when we first got saved and remember, my life was this and God changed me. I'm not going to walk away from Him. We must be reminded and stirred up in those things. We need to be able to survive when difficulty comes into our life and difficulty comes against us because it will. There will be rain and winds and storm. There will be darkness. There will be cold. You know what the remedy for all of those things is? Fire. To have a fire for the things of God burning in your heart that no one can put out. I want to close. We have got to stir that fire up inside of us. We need to praise God and worship God. We need to have a relationship with Him. We are not embarrassed or ashamed to worship God. The Bible says that that if you are ashamed of me, what? Then I will be ashamed of you on that day. We are Bible-believing Christians. We are not lukewarm religious people who go to a church. We are Bible-believing Christians who understand the day in which we live in and the storms of life that are surrounding us. And we must stir up the gift that is in us. And we must stir up the fire that is in us. We must be unashamedly Christians. We must worship Him. We cannot rely on other people to keep that fire burning in our lives. You cannot rely on your spouse. You cannot rely on your parents. There's an old cliche that you cannot ride your parents' coattails into heaven. You must make your own decisions. There is a certain point in life where you are making choices of whether or not you're going to live in sin, whether or not you're going to rebel and go into the world, or you're going to seek God and His kingdom. And there's a certain point when your parents may be able to ground you or whatever, but it doesn't matter because you're making those choices in your heart, your spirit, in your mind. And you have to make those on your own and no one can make them for you. Paul says to Timothy, 
in 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, he says, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. And Paul uses that term prisoner in, in the way of saying that I am totally submitted under him. Right? He says, but join me with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. We cannot be ashamed of the gospel. We cannot be ashamed of Jesus Christ. We worship him openly. We love him. We seek him. He is not a part of our life. He is our life. We must stir that up. Seek him every day. So I ask you right now, what are you personally doing to keep the fire of God burning in your spirit and in your life and in your home? What are you doing? What are you throwing on that fire? Are you in prayer? Do you pray? Do you worship God at home, on your own, in church? Do you read the Word of God? Do you make it a point to have a relationship with Him personally, on your own? Are you faithful? Are you sacrificial? Are you evangelistic? What are you doing to keep that fire lit? Because the world around you has every intention of throwing things on that fire too. Water, smoke, whatever they can to put that fire out. No one can do this for you. It's on you. The good thing is, it doesn't matter how far that fire has gone down, that you can light it. It does not matter how far. You may have a fire in your heart that is on the verge of going out and all it's doing is just smoldering and you feel like, where is God? Where is that excitement? I feel like God has left me, that He's not in my heart, He's not in my life, He's not moving. Where is He? Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 12, 20. He's quoting from Isaiah and He says, A battered reed He will not break off, and a smoldering wick He will not put out. It doesn't matter how far down that fire may have gone. God will help you light it back up so that it is burning and flaming inside of you once again. If you are just barely hanging on, don't let go. Don't give up. Keep pushing in. Just start throwing fuel on that fire. Begin to read your Bible. Begin to pray. Worship Him. Seek Him. Be in church. Allow God to breathe on your life and stir that fire back up once again because He will never ever let it go out if that is your heart's desire. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? A smoldering wick he will never extinguish. Perhaps you're here this morning and you need to make an acknowledgement that I need to get my heart right with God. I want him to not be second or third in my life. I want Him to be number one in my life. If you don't have a relationship with God, if you're not a Christian, you're not saved, you have not had that, that wonderful experience that we were talking about earlier of giving your life to Christ and Him lifting that burden off of your life. If you have not done that this morning, but you want to, Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. No one is looking around. This is between you and God. Just lift up your hand and make an acknowledgement that you want to give your life to Christ. Amen. I see that hand. You can put it down. 
there be anyone else, God is speaking to you and tugging on your heart this morning. You feel that in your spirit. You know if it's God speaking to you. And if it is God, don't hesitate.